Um, I'm at uh, Harvard in the physics department. And um, I'm going to tell you about a project that has um, finally ended and uh, started the Brain Eager Award you know, many, a large number of years ago um, to ask the question about um, you know, how brains grow. Um, and um, in, 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 in a complete way. Right? So, um, and this first slide sort of has the punchline. Um, for the last seven years, um, Jeff Lichtman at Harvard, Mei Zhen at Toronto, and I have been doing a project in connectomics for uh, those who don't know. Connectomics is um, a relatively new field, uh, which strives to get complete circuit level diagrams of brain regions or even entire brain. And um, we were interested in using connectomics to look at a particularly interesting um, axis um, of change of a whole brain, um, brain of Unicus C. elegans from birth to adulthood. With this animal, um, over the last seven years, uh, we were able to essentially reconstruct the entire the entirety of its uh, nervous system, uh, brain nervous system. Uh, um, a newly born animal, a few hours later, a few hours later, a few hours later, all the way to a couple of adults to look at um, and try to look at uh, principles uh, of brain maturation and growth. And those are what I'm going to tell you about um, in the course of this uh, half hour talk or so. All right, so this is obviously a very important question. Right? So uh, the brains of new newborns, the brains of my children who are just here and wander away. Uh, up to up to to my brain um, you know, are constantly changing. Which we're growing in order to you know uh, adapt to our changing body plan. You know, we get bigger, um, uh, and uh, also our experiences and learning. Right, we accrue information. We change we change our memories, which presumably change the way we behave and interact with the world. Okay, so and. You know, neuroscientists think this is all encoded in neural circuits. And you know, if you want to try to understand you know, brain growth uh, and maturity from birth to adulthood, um, you know, uh, that's sort of a very ambitious um, goal. Um, and, um, and, and but it's something that um, uh, is achieved, has become achievable in the last uh, several years. All right. So, in the last 10 years or so, there have been paper after paper after paper of people who have been using electron microscopy, serial section electron microscopy, to do dense reconstructions of brain tissue. All right, so here's a small piece of recently published and a couple years ago, uh, 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 about 100 micron, 100 micron, 100 micron block of a somatosensory cortex of a mouse. All right, so what people did to use serial section electron microscopy to uh, reconstruct the shape of every neuron and the position of every synapse and to get a complete wiring diagram of this tiny piece of tissue. All right, so how it's done is uh, in this movie, I don't know how well the movie played, um, but basically you take a block of tissue, uh, you, you, you fix it, uh, you fill it with electron dense uh, dye, you know, sort of heavy metals, and then you take pictures uh, with the electron micro microscope. You know, it's nanometer resolution. Um, in X and Y, a few nanometers in Z, and you take picture after picture after picture uh, and reconstruct the positions and shape of every neuron and every cell biological feature that's important to neurobiology, and you get it done, right? So you, uh, this is um, a large effort that ended up uh, giving it's just two of the neurons that were in that tissue, uh, but you can see you know, their connections, you know, how the neurons uh, are connected to one another. All right, so this is an immense amount of work. So you can sort of think about the petabytes of data uh, that are required. And you have nanometers of uh, level resolution. And you're looking at tissues that are, you know, centimeters uh, in size. And that's a lot of bits. That's a lot of bytes. It's a lot of information to collect. It's a lot of information to, to analyze. Um, but, you know, uh, these people are getting better and better and better at it. So it's getting faster and faster and faster. You know, large consortia, you know, people places like Google are getting interested in the problem. And I think in the next decade or several decades, you know, it's going to be possible to get connectomes, of, you know, of uh, a, 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 a mouse or chunks even of, of the human brain. 
All right, but you know, I didn't want to wait for that. You know, uh, I work on model organisms. I wanted to work on, we work on animals whose brains are small enough that even sort of at, the, at, the, at a bench top experiment, you can get connectomes of entire brain. All right, so uh, uh, an example of, a, of an animal that whose, whose connectome has recently been mapped is the Drosophila. You know, it's got uh, the order of 100,000 neurons. And it just came out on the bioarchive maybe a couple months ago. Uh, the full connectome of the Henry brain. So half a single brain of a Drosophila was finally done over the last 10 years. All right. Uh, but the model organism that I work on, the C. elegans, has even smaller numbers of brain neurons, only 300 neurons in total. And it's so small that we could use connectomics not just to get, you know, uh, climb Mount Everest and get one wiring diagram of one animal, which is what most people do, no, but can. Actually, actually get many, many, many animals that allow yes. us to, to, to do comparative connectomics and actually learn something. About, uh, about, about the relevance of the differences in, in, in connectomes and a, a, a useful and interesting axis, which is that of development, uh, you know, from birth to adulthood. Uh, okay, so, and C. elegans, because it's so small, was the first animal uh, for which it, uh, a connectome was ever put together. As many of you know. So, in the 1980s, um, Sidney Brenner and John White and people. Here. Uh, they actually got the first uh, connectome of a C. elegans sample, and they did it entirely by hand. Okay, they, they, they took a worm, actually many different worms, worm one, two, three, four, five, five different worms. They cut them up in pieces, and they, and they reconstructed the wire and it was a different portions, and they put it back together. So this is kind of like a Frankenstein worm. It's, like, so it's, it's sort of a stitched together connectome, but they, you know, but they got it. They got the first connectome in the 1980s, uh, and this was on the order of you know, 30 or so person years of work to get that connection. All right, but you know, um, I work at Harvard and my friend Jeff Lichtman, who's next door to me, um, has been working on high throughput connectomics and vertebrates. Um, we became friends and he's actually at heart, he's a developmental biologist. And, uh, you know, and we reasoned that, you know, this high throughput technology on C. elegans um, this can, can be used not just to get a single animal uh, like we did before, but actually many, many different animals in an informative way, right? From birth to adulthood and all through different larval stages of the elegans. Like the elegans take about one day to grow from uh, egg to adult. It's a hermaphrodite, um, so it's isogenic, right? So we can get a bunch of isogenic samples, samples of the, the, the same genome. And we can, in principle, use the, a pipe, build a pipeline. Uh, to get uh, connectomes. All right, so that's what we cut up to. And seven years ago, um, uh, 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 Ms. Jen from Toronto came and did a sabbatical at Harvard, and she's a really great electron microscopist in C. elegans, put together with, with Jeff's uh, high throughput stuff, and then you know, our lab's ability to do a bit of instrumentation in here and there, and, and we did, right? So you know, we made C. elegans samples, we cut them up, we imaged them, we processed the images and we rebuilt uh, wiring diagrams of whole animals, um, of eight whole animals, actually. Um, and actually, one important thing about this, these animals is that uh, the quality, actually, of the, of the EM that we're able to do in C. elegans, uh, not to brag, but it's, you know, the, uh, it's the highest quality of any connectome that people can do because we can do all of our samples with high pressure fluids. Right? So, uh, you know, most times when you when you, when you uh, get make an EM sample, uh, you have to uh, sort of just fix the sample. You know, dry it out, grease up, get rid of the, uh, the water, and you put the uh, put it in plastic, and so on. And that can lead to lots of perturbation of the morphology of the tissue. All right, but C. elegans, it's small enough that you can do high pressure freezing. You can freeze it at liquid nitrogen temperatures at 2,000 atmospheres. You can get animals that are frozen without the precise formation in their physiological state. Right? So a few nanoseconds before, milliseconds before the animal's frozen, uh, it doesn't know it's being frozen. So when you get the tissue, it looks exactly like it did in the actual um, animal. So this is a little bit inside baseball maybe, but you know, if you, a person who has looked at a lot of EDM and looked at this sort of slice of worm would be impressed by sort of the, the roundness of the, of the neurons and the space between the cells and the, the numbers of synapses are preserved and so on. So, uh, you know, high pressure freezing, that's one of the problems is you can't do it with big samples because you can't freeze a large chunk of tissue 
quickly enough or simultaneously, but you know, you can get about 200 microns worth of penetration for uh, if you're, if you're good at high pressure freezing and the entire diameter of the worm can fit in that. So the high pressure froze animals from birth to adulthood, uh, we reconstructed their synapses and, uh, and, and then we started to look. All right, so next video, it doesn't play very well. Uh, in, All right, so here's a sample. Uh, we sliced a bunch of worms, we reconstructed it, we uh, um, found every neuron, not just uh, the, 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 the skeleton of the neuron, but the actual full three-dimensional topology of every neuron and every touch of the neuron and every synapse inside the neuron. Uh, and we extracted it from these um, uh, serial section EMs and voila, brain emerges. Uh, so, um, there's about 200 neurons in the brain of C. elegans. Um, and every uh, one of those, every sensory neuron, every interneuron, every modulatory neuron, every motor neuron um, has to be reconstructed. And it's just one of our samples. And, you know, it looks quite beautiful. Uh, and, um, and that's just um, uh, nice to look at, uh, maybe. But um, from these, uh, but, um, but, 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 the, so I'm going to tell you the rest of the talk in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, what we've learned about how uh, wiring diagrams and, and, and the shapes of neurons changes over, over uh, the entirety of the course of an animal. And actually, some rather a number of surprises um, emerged. All right, so those are all the pictures that we reconstructed. Okay, so back to the talk. Um, uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, I go to the first one. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, uh, all right, so we did eight connectomes from birth to adulthood. Uh, early L1, which will be just hatched all the way to adulthood. That's what we got. All right, so the first thing that we learned um, is that the topology of the nervous system is largely preserved. All right, so the shape and the touch, the, the positions of all the neurons with respect to one another. Um, is essentially static uh, from, from birth to adulthood. All right, so uh, in terms of the shape of every neuron and how it touches every other neuron, uh, you have the L1 shape and position of every neuron. Just by a, a geometric scaling, you can get to this one, which is kind of surprising. All right, so there's not a lot of neurofiber growth or changes in the relative positions of neurons uh, that might help support uh, changes in uh, wiring. Uh, the, the, the topology, the thick scaffold on which uh, the, uh, the, the uh, synapse formation occurs. Right? So all persist, uh, contacts between neurons are persistent from birth to adulthood. Things get bigger, longer, fatter, uh, and so on. But um, the, the, the newborn brain, at least in terms of shape, is just a scaled version of the adult brain, which is not how I would expect uh, uh, my brain to be, but it's what uh, the elegant has. All right, so, uh, so, uh, so Robbie, can I, can I interrupt you and ask a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. So this means also that different worms have the same exact topology, because yeah. obviously your, your developmental series are different worms. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, this is a, these are three different our data sets, and we're looking at every different neuron, every neuron in the brain. No, I understand that, but I mean, uh, they're also, you know, the, the obviously, you're, 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 these are, this is not the same worm at different ages. This is different this is worms. Not the same different, right. this is so, therefore, so therefore, the topology is conserved from one worm to another. That's exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. topology is conserved. Yeah, so that must be genetically encoded and what have you. I'm sorry, um, you said you didn't quite expect this, and you know, can you tell me why you didn't expect this? I mean, we, we, we know that the cells sort of, when the worms develop, the the, the fate of the cells. Well, I didn't know about the topology uh, being st st static, and I, well, the reason I didn't expect it because we, we actually re when I said that we reconstructed the topologies after we did all the synaptic wiring. There was massive changes in, in the connectivity, which I thought might predict changes in topology. The neurons might have moved moved to one closer to one another, or shifted their position to gross synapse and so on. But that doesn't happen. Uh, but I'll tell you about that. And the order of, uh, of, of the way we analyzed our data, <laughs> it was a surprise. Um, anyway, okay, um, topology preserved. All right, uh, but there's massive, uh, um, 
what we observe is massive growth in synaptic uh, synapse numbers. All right, so an animal's new, uh, newborn animal has roughly 1,500 synapses, but it's got about over a five or six-fold growth in synapses. So the actual connections between neurons from growth to adult. All right, so there's massive changes in the numbers of synapses or, or, or numbers of synapses between cells. Now, in our vertebrate, you know, there's a lots of growth and change in the, the size of the, where neurons are with respect to one another to create the opportunity for new synapses to form. Here, there's massive synaptic growth. And this is what I, uh, when we first got this data, I thought maybe uh, some of these synapses uh, might have been created by area or positions created in topology. Right? So that's when I, when I met the exercise. All right. But you don't have to think about topology too much anymore. It's fixed. What we now have to do is think about, all right, all these synapses are being formed. Is it interesting? I mean, is it just a uniform sprinkling of synapses everywhere? Or is, it more, or, or is there more structure uh, that might be informative about um, how, how brains mature? And it's the latter. Okay, so um, this is just a small circuit of particular interest to me. Um, of sensory neurons, interneurons uh, that give rise to chemotaxis and thermotaxis. All right, from an L1 to an adult, um, there's a lot of connectivity between these in this particular chemotaxic circuit. The thickness of the arrows tells you how numbers of synapses between cells. Now you can see that there's a lot of thickening of the wires, right? More synapses per connection. That happens a lot. Uh, but there are different there are different colors because what we see is that there are many connections. Um, that are what we call developmentally dynamic. All right, these are connections between cells that occur in our data sets from a particular time point and all subsequent time points and no earlier time points. Right? So, at some point, at some age, stereotypically, every new animal will get a new connection between a pair of between two neurons. Right? So, that's the ADL neuron, newborn to ADA. Newborn to animal does not have it. At some point. Uh, that synapse occurs and it gets grown and all of our data sets have it, all whatever. All right, so at some point, all subsequent have a development through dynamic synapses. We also see a large number of synapses we call variable. These are synapses that only occur in one or two of our data sets but in no others, and it could happen at any, any time. Um, and that was a rather surprise. That was a big surprise for us because of the numbers of of, of, of connections in our nervous system um, over from birth to adulthood, which are in the in this variable uh, uh, category, right? So about roughly half of connections are in this variable category. They tend to be small synapses, you know, one or two or three synapses per connection. All right, so the numbers of synapses in the variable category are small, but the number of connections are large. But this is rather important, and it's rather a big surprise to the CLD community because. Um, you know, uh, right now there's one connectome in the, in, or to date, there's been one connectome in the 1980s. And basically, when people, when they do their neurobiology, they look at that wiring diagram and download it. And every synapse is sacred, sort of, right? Uh, if there's a connection between two neurons, it might have some mechanistic purpose. But what we would say is that roughly half of the connections in any particular brain of the elegans are variable. And only it's the strong connections that are, uh, that are stereotyped from, from, from animal to animal. And that's a big grain of salt because you know, there are many numbers of papers in the elegant literature. Even if there's one synapse between two neurons, are, the, people might think that there's a mechanism there. Um, so that's rather a surprise from the elegant community, which always thinks about the wiring as being highly stereotyped from animal to animal. And I would say not so. There's certain, quite a large amount of, of, of stochastic noise variability which is um, there. It might give rise to individual variability of behavior and so on, but it really is um, a rather big surprise that, um, that we saw. Okay, all right, so, uh, but is there a pattern? Uh, you can get all the variable connections between all the neurons, so these are all the nodes in some, you know, one of these network style ways of visualizing inside a network. Um, you can get all the variable connections, all the stable connections, Stable connections are ones in every animal from birth to adulthood. The dynamic ones are only occur at some particular time and all older. And variables are just, you know, there are one or two of the data sets, but no others. Okay. Um, and indeed, there is a big strong pattern in where these, um, these 
these uh, circuits, these connections are added, the connections are added. All right, so red, uh, so we have sensory neurons. If you look at it in terms of hierarchy, sensory to enter the motor, the muscle, the muscle neuron, and look at the relative plasticity and the kinds of pathways we have, the sensory to enter neuron or enter neuron to motor neuron, or this motor neuron to muscle, and look at the plasticity, developmental plasticity that occurs in any particular class of connections. You know, there's a lot of plasticity everywhere, right? From motor neurons to muscle cells, especially. That's because you know, the animals are bigger, lots more muscle cells, lots more motor neurons. There's a lot of plasticity there. Uh, a lot of plasticity in the way sensory neurons talk to one another. Uh, but there's a remarkable uh, absence of plasticity right in the middle of the brain, the interneuron, the interneurons to interneurons, the CPU, right? The center of the brain. Um, every animal from birth to adulthood has the same central processes. Right, the connections between interneurons to interneurons um, is static uh, from birth to adulthood, and that was the big surprise. So the big surprise to me, uh, you know, I just had my six-year-old here uh, talk, uh, and saw. You know, I, I naively expect, you know, it, uh, his uh, retina and my retina have pretty much the same wiring. I would expect that his spinal cord and my spinal cord have pretty much the same wiring, but I would expect our my our cortices to be quite different. Because he's learned different things in my 40 years of life and his six years of life, right? Uh, but that's not how it works in C. elegans, right? The, the, the CPU is, 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 is the static. But what we, in order to get different behaviors from birth to adulthood, there's a change in the way information is formatted before it goes into the CPU. There's a change in the way information is read out of the CPU. The CPU itself has um, static uh, principles of, of operation. And Jeff, my friend Jeff Lickman, uh, thought, wow, this is exactly like the way the cerebellum might be. Um, all right, so the cerebellum, of course, is one of the most ancient uh, brain structures in, in, in vertebrates. And Jeff tells me that, you know, if you look at the cerebellum of like a frog or a fish or a, or, or a human or a mouse, the wiring of the cerebellum is, rather, is, is, is surprisingly conserved. It's in the middle. So the cerebellum is a sensory motor structure. It gets sensory inputs from animals with very, very different sensory systems. And a sense of motor outputs to animals with very, very, very different uh, motor, motor the body parts. But the way that cerebellum processes information or maps sensory inputs to motor outputs is, could be preserved because it's got very, very um, uh, um, uh, 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 similar wiring across, you know, phyla. And that's very interesting, right? I mean, it's, there's a principle of evolution there. Uh, there's something pointing to you know, universal computation, uh, perhaps. What they are, we don't know, but um, the, the connection is, is, is evokes rather, um, uh, is rather interesting. Uh, all right, so that's one way in which the, the connection is taught something. Another, actually, really remarkable thing uh, discovered by Daniel Ripley, the first author of this paper, who analyzed a lot of the data, was to look at, all right, so, uh, You've got different pathways from sensory to intra to motor to non periphery neurons, right? Some are feed forward, they go from upper levels to lower levels. Uh, some are feedback, they go from lower levels to upper levels, and there's a lot of recurrence. All right, so if you look at the numbers of synapses that are added across these different kinds of pathways, from birth to adulthood, there's a systematic increase in the feed forward synapse. So there's a systematic decrease in feedback and, uh, 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 and recurrence synapses. Um, in total proportion. All right. So over time, the system becomes more and more reflexive, it becomes more and more input to output, it becomes more uh, 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 sort of um, uh, hardwired in terms of input output relationships to the whole to the network as a whole. Um, it becomes a lot more automatic. And that's rather remarkable too, right? Because by the time you get to be an, get to be an adult, you sort of have a fixed set of sensory motor uh, uh, relationships that you use to enact your behaviors, but the newborn has a lot of feedback uh, in its circuit, perhaps to learn or help adapt uh, the behaviors to in, in an appropriate way. Now, it's entirely speculative, maybe, but um, it's sort of evocative of the way uh, machine learning works. All right, so if you want a system to have a particular input-output relationship, you know, these sort of um, networks which are everywhere now. Um, how do you get these input output relationships to be in a particular to do a particular thing? You use feedback and recurrence, uh, right? Um, 
use feedback to uh, train the network uh, over time. And once the network has tra been trained to get a particular input-output pattern, you remove the, the feedback and it works in a particular way. I don't know, but uh, it's super interesting to me that the entire nervous system of C. elegans, the key as a whole, has this kind of sort of flavor. Uh, the last you know, big sort of uh, 20,000 foot pattern that we observed in the wiring diagram when we looked at entire connections across development is uh, comes from sort of network uh, theory. All right, so modularity or communities. All right, so all of us, you know, if you look at uh, any sort of brain network and the vertebrates or whatever, um, we think about circuits as being working in communities, uh, retina, spinal cord, I have different brain regions for different things. Okay, so uh, we have the complete wiring diagram and we can sort of assess the community structure of all of the networks um, in the brain that do that. And there's a systematic change in the modularity of the nervous system from birth to adulthood. If you look at a newborn uh, circuit and you look at the connectivity of the modularity of its nervous system, the community structure, there's not very much. There's like more sensory level, there's a motor level. But as the animal gets bigger and bigger and older and older, um, community structure gets more and more fragmented um, as you have distinct groups of neurons which are becoming more clustered in terms of the connectivity and functional role, right? Um, you start with just sensory neurons and motor neurons, by the time you're an adult, you've got specialized motor neurons for head movement, body movements, and, and, and uh, neck movement. You've got different sensory neurons that are, that are talking to their for in, in different regions for, um, for, for chemosensory and uh, uh, thermosensory and um, sort of more uh, gustatory uh, roles, right? Um, becoming more and more specialized. And that's super interesting too, uh, that over time you become more and more sophisticated. You have more uh, specialization uh, in the nervous system for discrete tasks, just like you know, my brain works. Uh, because, you know, actually this is interesting to us because you know, if you look at the most primitive invertebrates, like the hydra, Right? Um, it has at most a two-layer nervous system. Right? There's two kinds of neurons that it has. Uh, but if you look at the fruit fly, it's got a brain with, um, of, in terms of uh, discrete communities and modules for different computations, uh, with a complexity that rivals uh, mine. Um, and this is interesting to me from a point of ontogeny and phylogeny. Right? So, um, uh, you know, actually, um, and this is a famous uh, uh, picture from the 19th century. Uh, Heckel, I think, was taken from a book by um, Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, he used to be my neighbor, actually, he lived on Second Street, and a couple of floors down from me. But anyway, um, if you look at you know, the brains or the bodies of, you know, of, most, uh, of, 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 of almost any, if it's me, a fish, or a monkey, or whatever, um, at uh, early stages, you know, we're all kind of the same. Uh, but as you get, uh, as you change in developmental time, of course, you can kind of start having different um, um, features which are specialized with for, for different evolutionary adaptations. And I wonder if the newly born C. elegans is kind of like a hydra, and the adult C. elegans is kind of like a fruit fly, right? Uh, um, and um, I wonder if comparative um, uh, across uh, different nematode species. Um, which would teach me something about um, the evolution of the brain. Uh, and actually, the CDC algorithm might be a great way of place to look at this kind of thing. Um, Posmia, phylogeny, and neurobiology. Um, you know, there are roughly 16,000 nematode species, and they've been evolving for 600 million years. And you know, there are nematode species that are different from one another evolutionarily, as you know, I am from a fish. Um, so, um, and there's all relatively small, you know, uh, and high throughput connectomics that articulate the, the, the connectomics of, of large numbers of animals, these interesting animals across their developmental time courses, across evolution, and really tell us how uh, brains came to be, not just from birth to adulthood, but across the, uh, the history of, 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 of biological evolution. Okay, so the project is done at, that, at this particular level, you know, the elegance from birth to adulthood. It was a large collaboration so it was many, many different labs over almost a de decade, uh, but it's done and it's now on the bioarchive. Now we have to try to get it to a proper journal. Uh, 
uh, it's the largest endeavor I've ever been on, involved in. Uh, but I think that it is uh, really um, going to be important. Okay. Uh, the principal labs are the ones that were started the seven years ago. And the principal labs are Justice and from Harvard and myself. Um, and um, I've used up all my time and then some. I had a couple of questions to chew out. Um, Probably used up my time for questions, but um, I'll leave it to the organizers to let me uh, see if there's any Q and A time. But uh, but um, I hope that you take a look at the bioarchive article and um, tell me what you think. All right. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, if anybody wants to have a question, I'm happy to to, 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 to answer. Oh, in the chat. Oh, oh my time is up. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right, if you have questions, it is time for questions. Uh, this is Herbie again. So, I mean, Hydra, it seems like the antithesis of conserving topology because neurons, as far as I understand, neurons keep coming in all the time and get rewired all the time into some almost random network. So it is quite interesting, you know, to, to sort of speculate how this is connected to your C. elegans, which seems very different than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what will happen if you look at a different nematode. I mean, one possibility is that the topology that different nematodes are highly preserved, but the, you know, the, the, the synaptic layouts are different. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, but it's something that is worth looking at, um, for sure. Uh, and then maybe more distantly related uh, nematodes will have different topologies, uh, giving right, giving it, creating a scaffold for different possibilities in brain structure. Nobody knows. This is something very basic that nobody knows. Uh, but, you know, the last nectone that we got, but the first nectone that we got when we first did, did, did started doing this took two years to do. The last nectone that we got took two months to do. So, and I think there's another order of magnitude where the speed we can get. And um, so it's not impossible to, to really uh, use this technology to look at potential questions across evolution, across development, across even animals with different experiences, right? Um, uh, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, it's, it's really, again, I wanted to ask this precisely this point. I mean, so how these animals are all raised in exactly the same condition. So maybe that's, maybe that's what affects uh, the sort of the fact that you have synapses that are become so frozen by the time they are adults. Like, uh, maybe you're just sampling from from animals that are basically living in on a dish in a very simple world all across. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for all the animals we did, we think that we have grown pretty much identically, which was actually one of the reasons, which is make, makes a variable, variable synapse even more surprising. Right. But we actually have an, a, a project, we have a project to grow worms in two different ways. You know, one where they're really abused as, as, as you know, from birth, right? Uh, so that they go into something called a dower phase. And ones that are well fed and happy throughout life, right? Um, these two animals, we expect to have massive components of the differences, and we're, you know, like, um, and we, we're, we're going to try to map those differences uh, to the level of whole thing. So Simon Sponberg here. Um, I, Ilya sort of asked, similar to the question I was going to ask. I, I think it's really interesting that you're finding this uh, individual variability. Um, I think we would sort of expect that from all the stuff that is shown that individuals have uh, different types of <laughs> individuality, right? Um, uh, even in even in C. elegans, I think there was some some evidence for that. But I, I guess I was it seemed like it was crying out for an experiment, manipulation, right? That could systematically examine some of these uh, the these patterns that you're starting to see. And I, I think you you just sort of suggested one rearing them in two different environments. But I guess maybe we can turn looking forward with connectomics, especially in C. elegans, long term, how, how do we take the next step with these tools to go to sort of this mechanistic understanding that you, I think these questions are sure you getting at? Where do you sort of see the future of that? Well, I think uh, um, in the field of connectomics, C. elegans, the connectomics has become, or most fields, connectomics isn't viewed as a deployable tool, right? It's so hard to do. It takes so much effort to get a connectome. But most people try to do their neurobiology and their behavioral analysis and their imaging analysis without it, <laughs> right? You, uh, you focus on a particular couple of neurons, and whether, not, whether they're connected or not, or a small circuit, like with these jobs, Google's ball circuit, and try to get answers. But 
you know, I was, you know, the, the brain is a network, right? And a change in one place can have, you know, uh, rippling effects throughout, right? And I think that kind of understanding the full consequence of a perturbation in one part of the circuit is best understood if you have a whole circuit um, visualized, just like, you know, whole genome sequencing has changed the way that people uh, uh, do, do, do molecular triangulation analysis. So, I would like the C. elegans and the and then coming to see elegance to be a, something that's easy to do, uh, so that anybody can do it. And you know, it's not it's sort of possible to get a whole connectome of an animal, not in months or years, but in days. And then use it to understand lots of things, you know, like mutants or animals with different experiences. And get complete answers, right? Not speculative answers based on sort of the small tunnel vision thing that you look at, you know, where, where you know how they look. But, you know, Look at the whole thing and see uh, what, what, what might have changed that you might have missed. Um, in C. elegans, you know, connectomics is, uh, I think, is going to become a deployable tool. Some people will do it just like the ones one has. It's also become possible uh, uh, to, to do whole brain imaging uh, via another species, things like that. Uh, um, okay, can we? So in C. elegans, yeah, it's, it's a, I think the future is bright for systems level. All right, I think we need to move on to Joshua Weitz. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? You are. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thanks so much for being our speaker today. Great, thanks. I'll start. Can you see the full screen? Just I'll ask that once and then, and as long as it moves forward. Did you see that happen? Yes. No. Okay. I'll get started. I'm Joshua Weitz from Georgia Tech. I'll be talking about efforts that we've been working on with collaborators to understand some of the foundational elements of COVID-19 dynamics, explain a little bit of how we got here, and some thoughts on how we might get out. And this is a partial talk. We've been working on a number of different facets. I've listed them here. Again, everything from characterizing epidemiological characteristics uh, to understanding some of the notion of expected dynamics, whether they should be peaks or plateaus, getting into forecasting of the level of Georgia, and also uh, thinking hard about interventions. And just before I start, I want to uh, note that this is funded by a number of different groups and on borrowed time at times, and also the result of truly interdisciplinary collaborations, both within the folks at our team, but also across Georgia Tech and with collaborators both in the U.S. and internationally. And I think uh, many of you are aware that this has been a growing, escalating situation. This is a WHO situation report. And I hope you can see that. Can I just get one confirmation? Someone can see it on my screen. It doesn't show it, but I'm hoping it does on yours. What are you looking for? Can you see the, it said my sharing was paused. Oh, there you go. So now we're looking at a map. Okay, somehow that when I went to the full screen mode, it said it was paused. It said sharing is paused. Huh. Let me see if I can. We see it. Do you see the map? Yeah, China's in the middle with a big red dot. And now do you see uh, stacked bar charts? On the left side. Oh, well, there's still a map with a little no. OK, so that's not working. Let me share a different app that doesn't seem to want to work. Sorry about that. I thought I had it a moment ago, but I have a backup. Let's try sharing PowerPoint this time. Great. How about that? That looks better. Looks great. There we go. Okay, good. So you see a map, I, I think. Um, that's where I left off. This is February 9th. We led a Georgia Tech rapid response workshop the next day. And as you can see, this was talking about tens of thousands of cases and hundreds of deaths largely focused on China and East Asia. And this is the situation from yesterday. In the U.S. alone, there are over uh, 110,000 fatalities, uh, multiple millions of cases globally at this point above 9 million cases. So obviously this is a global pandemic, it's severe. We're having this meeting because of it in this format and for the foreseeable future. Um, at the very start, and really even now, some of the ongoing problems centered on trying to even characterize what we're up against. 
And this plot from February from the New York Times, I think makes it clear the sort of tension points, one of which is the characteristic spread of any particular disease can be expressed in terms of what is often called the basic reproductive number or this R naught. It's not the only number that's relevant, but it's relevant. And it's equal to the average number of new infections per infectious individual in an otherwise susceptible population. It's sort of an intrinsic characteristic. It depends not just on the ideology of the disease, but also on transmission interactions and so on. And there's the other issue, of course, which is how severe it is. If a disease transfers itself to many people but doesn't cause many severe illnesses like the common cold, we're not going to stop society. So it's not just a matter, obviously, of the number of people who are sick, but the number of people who are severely sick or the number of fatalities. And at the outset, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the R0 number is with this range between about one and a half and three and a half, and also a lot of uncertainty about the fatality rate. And I think we now understand uh, that this fatality rate, which can be measured in terms of cases, is actually itself hard to measure, even though one directly measures total fatalities, because there are many asymptomatic cases that we don't know about. So the intrinsic fatality rate, the infection fatality rate, is something often hard to measure. And so this was really one of the questions at the outset, how bad might this be? And focusing in our R0 was one of the ways that I think people began to assess both this R0 and fatality rate number. And so I just want to point out, I know many of you have probably been reading, maybe even contributing to some of the literature on trying to understand COVID-19, both dynamics and exit strategies. And in this series of plots, I'm going to reveal some issues that make this difficult, particularly at the outset of an epidemic. And unfortunately, that's where we largely are. This is a stochastic simulation, which uh, I've um, set up to have some variation, but with an R0 that I know it should be one and a half. So on the average, one and a half new individuals per are sick for each infectious individual at the outset. And this is a different epidemic with R0 of two, and the third one with R0 of 2.5. And you'll notice that these curves, these solid curves, red, green, blue, going from bottom to top, all look exactly the same. They are essentially the same, even though the dynamic model underlying them truly has these different R0 numbers. And I don't think this is as well appreciated as it should be, which is at the outset of an epidemic, diseases with different characteristic strengths can have the observed number of cases, essentially the same number of observed cases. The divergence happens later. So what I'm showing here on the left is early, which look the same, and late, which look different. And in doing so, I want to highlight three concepts that to me I find uh, helpful in trying to organize my thoughts about interpreting what's going on with COVID-19 dynamics, one of which is simply the speed, the characteristic exponential, at least at the outset, growth rate of an epidemic. The size, which is maybe the peak size, the peak number of cases, or the total number of individuals who are sick related to something called herd immunity. And these things are themselves related by this notion of strength, this intrinsic individual level capacity of a particular pathogen to spread in a population. And so the tentative conclusion here that I just want to get straight away is that many values of R0 can be compatible with the same observed rate of increase in cases, even if the outbreak sizes are different, which is often why modelers are focusing on trying to infer the strength from the speed so that we get some sense of the size of the epidemic and with some notion of fatality rate, notion of the severity in terms of hospitalizations and fatalities. These models are often based on simple assumptions. I won't belabor them, only to say that they're often based on a core idea that they're susceptible individuals who get infected. Those infectious individuals recover over some time scale, and they're either recovered or removed, depending on the severity. There are different population class issues which divide individuals up, and there are these mechanisms of infection recovery. And you can turn these sorts of models into individual-based models, stochastic models, metapopulation models, and so on. But in essence, all of them divide up individuals based on their disease status. At the outset, at least, the expected number of cases is expected to grow exponentially, where this growth rate depends on the th threshold parameter, this basic reproductive number. When it's above one, cases are expected to grow, and when they're below one, they should decline. And the key point here is that this basic reproduction number is the product, in the simplified sense, of the infections per time multiplied by an infection infectious period, right? So these two things come together. And the rate then depends on the difference between R0 and 1 and also this infectious period. But this begins to tell you why there's at root an identifiability problem. Because two different things, one which has the length in which an individual is infectious, which may be variable, and also this infections per time, this transmissibility, come together to yield the strength. 
And this also means that there's this implicit link between what we observe, the ob observed speed, and the strength. So if we observe the same incidence rate shown here on the left and right panel, which are the same fundamental growth rate curve, but the generation intervals are shorter, that means that the strength is actually lower. And on the right, you can see these are the same uh, case data, but longer generation intervals, in other words, longer uh, transmission periods, which means fewer numbers of infectious periods to yield the same observed case counts can only be made sense of if the reproduction number, this average number of new infectious individuals caused by a single infectious individual and otherwise susceptible population is higher. Right? So there's this implicit link, which has always been appreciated. The details have to do with generating uh, functions and so on, but I'm going to put it just at that level of detail. Once you understand that, you actually can make sense of headline news. So this is a Forbes article, this is from early April. The COVID-19 uh, disease may be twice as contagious as we thought. No, it's just if we make assumptions that the intervals are longer between when someone's infected and when they infect someone, or when they have a symptom and when they, someone they infect has a symptom, we get a higher r naught value. You can see that in the upper left, which is depending on the observed growth rate that speed on the x-axis, as assumptions are made that the intervals are longer, the r naught estimate by definition goes up. So this entire sort of mini cycle of news was really driven just by a different assumption, an assumption about the generation interval, or in this case, the serial interval, which is the difference between when someone gets sick and when the person they infect gets sick. We've worked on this, and I'm not gonna belabor this point, only to say that we've gone back to some of these early estimates and taken a look at assumptions, finding that what's really driving some of these initial estimated values of R0 was that they use different assumptions or had different measurements slightly about the growth rate. They measured different speeds to some extent, but really they made different assumptions. You can see this in the upper middle panel here of this mean generation interval, whether it was 10 days or more like eight days or some variability. And that, in its essence, is driving how much strength we think this disease has, its capacity to spread, and therefore some notion of final size. And I do think, though, that these early estimates are more or less right, that the intrinsic or not is about three with significant uncertainty, but at least that begins to explain why variability in the generation interval, and in fact, knowing more about the generation interval can matter. And going back to this condition for epidemic growth, we have this notion that this R0 value is a product of transmissibility times the period of infection. And again, this infections per time is itself a product of how many people an infectious individual might interact with per unit time. What's the chance they're contacting with a susceptible individual? And what's the probability that that contact leads to a new transmission? This, even though it's simplified, provides a guide for how people think about control. If we can somehow reduce the infectious period right, by uh, hospitalizing or treating individuals. And again, treatments at the moment are not necessarily available. That is one way. Or by isolating them. How do we stop them from interacting with other people? Again, through contact tracing, targeted isolation. How do we reduce the, the probability of contacts with the susceptible? Various kinds of closures, social distancing, the cessation of large gatherings, these kind of meetings instead of in-person meetings. And finally, if there is a situation where people can't avoid being in close contact, that's when we get into masks and process engineering. In other words, trying to reduce the probability that a potentially infectious contact can transmit the disease. So all of these fold in and in some sense give guidance as to the strategies that public health officials and those who practice in the field are trying to recommend and really trying to use those as dials. And they're trying to use them as dials to attack what in essence is a big problem, as we know, and one that doesn't necessarily need a very complicated model to make sense of. In the US alone, with a population of about 330 million, a very simplified model of a disease that has a strength of R0 about 2.4, even one that's higher, implies 80% infected or more. And I should say that's in a mean field sense. And if I had more time, I would talk about various ways in which I think these mean field models, these assumptions that there's homogeneous mixing in a population are perhaps not ideal. It is a respiratory disease, so it's not the same as a sexual contact network or other kinds of diseases. Nonetheless, there are ways in which variability could actually drive that lower. But if you assume that something like 80% might be infected in a baseline case, and there's a little bit less 
than a 1% chance when pooled across different population level risks, you get about 2 million fatalities. And that's about what this Imperial College uh, of London model predicted um, going back even to March and into April. So it's clear there's a major problem. We look in the United States with, again, already 110,000 fatalities, and yet most of us remain susceptible, which is problematic. So this informs this effort to have large-scale interventions. And I just want to have a few comments about evidence that these interventions have had an impact. First of all, from China, there was work done by uh, Sam Scarpino and colleagues at Northeastern examining, in some sense, the relationship between mobility and cases. And what they found, and you can see here this uh, correlation value, which is not the same as causality, but still was strongly linked between case counts and mobility until there was was, in essence, a cordon sanitaire, in other words, trying to stop people's movements, and then this correlation decreased. And in other words, the point they're making is that insofar that we're early in epidemic, that early actions uh, make sense because in some sense you're trying to stop import of cases. But once import has happened, community transmission is the dominant factor. So efforts that people made at the outset to try to restrict travel are effective insofar as you actually stop it from coming in to where you are, to your locale. But at that point, early interventions of another kind are important. I'll just highlight some of our own work in Georgia. We've been monitoring this since March. And in uh, the month of April, we began to train uh, some of our work a little bit uh, in a more sophisticated sense through an age structure metapopulation model that takes into account heterogeneity in counties and mobility, as well as the intrinsic age structure of Georgia and ask the question, what do we expect the next few months to look like? And we projected that insofar as the trend in April continued, that we didn't make much of a change, which is essentially a 50% reduction from what we thought the baseline was, we expect to be in a plateau. And what you can see in that center green curve in the bottom and the center dash line is that we remain around that plateau. I should point out there's been a worrisome uptick in cases in the last seven days. We're monitoring it. We don't know if that means it's a fluctuation or like other states, there may be an unfortunate rise. And because fatalities and hospitalizations are lagged indicators, we're also concerned this could lead to increase in hospitalizations and fatalities. I wanna also point out that you can see the back to business as usual, which is going off screen here. And by our counts, this is essentially tens of thousands of fatalities averted. So there's been a significant positive impact with respect to social distancing. There could have been a better impact, as we show with the 75% scenario, uh, but we are not in the clear by any means because we remain almost entirely uh, immunologically naive. Other groups have done the same thing in European contexts. This is, again, the Imperial College London report, which forecasted in March on the order of tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of fatalities over even beyond that now. And as we all know, Europe is in a very different situation than we are. This work updated to some of the more recent data came out in nature just a few weeks ago. So I think overall the point here is that there have been interventions uh, that have become population wide and when enacted uh, with often um, some negative consequences for socioeconomic indicators for health and so on. Nonetheless, they have had significant benefits. But this has led in some ways to this zero-sum dichotomy. The idea is that we're going to flatten the curve, or as the uh, cartoon says, was the Tao to die for today or what? And I realize that at the speed at which these cartoons are going, this is a little outdated, yet we're still faced with this, what I view in some sense, as a false zero-sum dichotomy, either or. And some of what I think many of us have been thinking about it, are what are the sensible, actionable ways to exit in the absence of a vaccine or um, effective therapeutics. And one way from the outset, this work by Christoph Frazier that have been clearly a path forward has been systematic, large-scale testing, not testing for surveillance. In other words, how many people estimated are sick or diagnosis, do you or not have COVID-19 so we can treat you or isolate you in the right way, but actually as a mitigation to stop new chains of transmission. And that's the whole point of testing and contact tracing. And their point here is the faster one does that, the better the chances that one can reduce are not or are effective to less than one. And delays in these things, which unfortunately 
we've been working with delayed testing and delayed tracing. If any of you have done a test and it takes you three days to find out the answer, and that itself takes three more days to initiate contact tracing, you've lost the bulk of the opportunity to try to contact someone to get tested, to quarantine, uh, and maybe even stop a new chain from beginning. And just in case there was any doubt, uh, this is from a Google search of testing, and you see, as you probably have heard, that some folks, including our president, have said, you know, that we need to slow the testing down, please. And Fauci, thankfully, has said, no, we're going to be more testing, not less. But the reality is we've been doing less, not more, for far too long, and it has come with perilous consequences. There are other ideas, of course, how to get out of this, including masks, a low-cost, high-impact intervention, uh, bubbles, and New Zealand is an example of, a, of uh, a country that obviously has made incredible progress, gotten to zero cases, symptom tracker apps to try to get a sense um, of whether or not uh, there's some relationship or prognostic uh, value in trying to identify cases without PCR testing, any other ideas like work shift theories, being on and off both in time and in space. But the bulk of these focus on reducing new transmission. I want to emphasize that mask wearing is obviously critical and, and has been underplayed in some ways. And I think we have a lot of evidence now that that should be done. But what about all those who have already been sick and recovered? Could these infections at a level far from herd immunity help reduce collective risk? So this is what we've been working on uh, both here at Georgia Tech and with others and now uh, as part of a new collaboration with folks at Emory University to try to think about what we term shield immunity, different from herd immunity, that is using large-scale serological testing to reduce transmission and enable economic development. The idea in a nutshell is that one can identify individuals who may have recovered through antibody testing, i.e. serological testing, and if individuals who are recovered elevate their interactions, particularly in certain settings which we know can often lead to high transmission events, it's possible that a potentially risky interaction between a susceptible infectious individual could be replaced by having that recovered individual interact either with the susceptible or the infectious individual, thereby diluting out these risky interactions, shielding both from potential new transmissions. In a context of uh, a network, you can imagine that there's an individual who has unknown infection status of others, and we've been treating this in the absence of testing, essentially by breaking links. Our hope, uh, particularly in some pilot cases that I'll talk about near the end, is to prioritize interactions between individuals who have recovered uh, and thereby reducing the chance that an individual might uh, unintentionally or knowingly interact uh, in this high-risk way with an infectious individual. And just to keep in mind again that PCR provides the snapshot, are you shedding virus now potentially, and serological testing for antibodies provides a history. Have you been infected recently in the past? And together thus far, uh, we understand uh, that recovery, in other words, seroconversion, implies protection from reinfection. We can get into how long we think that might last. Uh, other issues with respect to the duration of seropositives, if folks are interested at the end. We took this uh, simple idea and embedded it in an SAR-like model and other extensions. And instead, therefore, of thinking about a standard contact rate model, we consider the case where if you ask, what is the chance that you interact with someone who's susceptible? That used to just be, you know, you think at random, S divided by N. But if individuals who are recovered have elevated their contacts, you're more likely to run into them. And we get this dilution effect here, this one plus alpha R, where alpha is the shield strength. You can think of this as how many of these interaction, uh, the elevation rate of interactions by recovered individuals. If they don't do anything, we're back to the traditional model. There are different variants of this, which we go into detail, including models in which we don't elevate the total number of interactions, but essentially make sure that the total number of actions is constant. The point here is that the epidemic size can be reduced far below the herd immunity threshold and far below that in the null expectation, even if only a small fraction of individuals are recovered insofar as they increase their interactions. There are challenges to take such a simple model and put it in the COVID-19 context. One reason is that there's a significant asymptomatic route. I haven't talked about it today. We have a paper that just came out in epidemics that goes through why both the uh, incident level of asymptomatic cases, but also their duration can have significant effects on epidemic strength and therefore potential. But in essence, we took this kind of setup where susceptible people are exposed 
Some have asymptomatic or mild infections, some symptomatic infections. Those which are asymptomatic recover. Those who have symptomatic infections, some of them are hospitalized, and some of those hospitalized individuals have critical infections, some of which lead to fatalities. We take this sort of model and then ask the question, in an age-structured context, if individuals who recover act to confer shield immunity, how well can that affect uh, the epidemic course? And what we find is that shielding can be used synergistically with social distancing in some sense to combine less intense social distancing with shielding to have population-wide benefits. This is a heat map of the level of shielding on the x-axis with the level of social distancing on the y-axis. And the point I'm trying to make here is that whatever level of social distancing you want moving across here can be synergistic. And on these contour lines, you can see you can get the same benefits of high, often costly social distancing with lower levels of social distancing and some levels of shielding. We've done the same thing with uh, examining time course of disease in terms of deaths per day, ICU beds, cumulative deaths by age. And again, the point here is that these are both shortening the epidemic peak in terms of moving it earlier, uh, reducing the total size of epidemic. And in essence, uh, this is also reducing the number of expected fatalities largely are in the uh, 55 uh, and older regime. And this is drawing down, uh, even though this is happening at all ages, it's drawing down those fatalities and the severe infections from that older, higher risk age group. And in fact, uh, part of our applied work is to actually look at ways to focus these shielding efforts in high-risk groups, further increasing the benefits. The challenge, of course, is how much of this is feasible. There's been concerns about immunity passports, what I think of as immunity visas, given that I don't think we should expect their five or ten years of duration, but rather need to be revisited, a transient status that could have benefits. And so we've partnered with folks at Emory University, Alicia Cray, Kristen Nelson, scientists, and Ben Lopeman's group, to take this core idea and then add to it the analytical test features. The fact that when you test, you sometimes get false negatives. So an individual who's recovered doesn't show up as seropositive or false positive. Someone who is susceptible or exposed and who shows up as having a seroconversion positive. And obviously false positives are problematic. They have to do with the specificity of the test because that would imply we've elevated the rate of interactions of someone who we should not have. So we take those analytical test features, add age stratified risk uh, and realistic mixing, and make the following conclusions. It would take a significant increase of investment of testing, from testing rate at the order of 1% per year, 10% to year or yearly, really to the level of monthly, to make the benefits. So the idea of testing people more frequently is that you're getting more and more people released from social distancing, but the benefits of shield immunity kick in when people actually elevate their interactions. And a few months ago, I would have said this was probably not feasible because of poor performing tests, but there's been a number of high performance tests with specificity nearing 100% in which our objective here is to both balance the need to release those from social distancing, but also as you can see here, these different um, uh, curves of the cumulative fatalities in this epidemic when there's no distancing, when there's some intermediate levels, and you can see they're all driven down when serotestin gets to be about the monthly scale. Obviously, this is something which the U.S. has lagged both on serotestin and uh, PCR-based testing. Our hope is that this begins in particular settings like healthcare settings, and even nursing uh, home settings, to motivate higher frequency testing as part of an intervention strategy. And again, the takeaway here in thinking about the synergistic effect in terms of test frequency and relaxation is we're looking for blue on both sides here. So this is fatalities, we want them to be lower, which happens when we test more frequently. And also we want to be release more people from social distancing because there are costs of having um, severe social distancing. And we find that there can be levels in which more people are released from social distancing and also you're reducing uh, the number of fatalities. So it's really about combining these two metrics, thinking about trying of ways to get out of this dichotomy even with imperfect tests. And I'll just say, as, as getting to the close here, we're putting a lot of our initial efforts focusing on particular scenarios, including nursing homes and other healthcare settings. This is from a few weeks ago in Georgia, in which about half the fatalities came from nursing homes. So this is clearly uh, a significant problem. These also 
can be seeded from the community, but then staff cases can go back into the community. Uh, this is a at-risk group with many reasons why they're higher risk, both age and comorbidities, and it's a significant driver of COVID-19 induced fatalities, but also one in which serotesting initiatives could be used for good at a smaller pilot scale. And that's what we're doing on, uh, working on, excuse me, now, which is thinking about shield immunity protocols, thinking hard about serotesting and PCR testing, and thinking about taking the same principles I've laid out thus far and putting them into, uh, let's say, a bipartite network context, where instead of thinking about population-wide interventions, thinking hard about ways to have consistent staffing or infection-driven status staffing. Again, with the intention to re reduce the risk that an infected um, resident might infect a staff member who then goes on to infect new residents and so on, leading to higher levels of fatalities. And hopefully we'll have more to report on that soon. And I just want to close with one idea. This applies both to antibody tests and PCR tests. That there's been a number of cases of uncertainty. First, it was masks. Then it was, was uh, recovery implied protection. We are not going to have 100% certainty, but there are ways in which the benefits, given some uncertainty, do require that we take action. If we wait for two years to find out the duration of immunity, it'll be too late. If we wait to find out that masks are 100% effective, that's gonna to be too late to know that maybe some use of masks can be beneficial. I mean, keep in mind these are threshold systems. We don't have to drop our naught to zero, we have to drop it below one, which is a much more practical goal, and frankly, some countries have managed to do it. So just a few last thoughts, one of which is that COVID-19 has this epidemiological feature of higher naught, relatively fast spread, unfortunately elevated fatality rates, particularly in older individuals and those with certain comorbidities, and also asymptomatic transmission that has become very difficult to control spread, particularly for that reason. Interventions have made an enormous impact. They have been costly in other senses. We have not reached that first peak because we remain immunologically naive. So we need thoughtful exit strategies. We should not and cannot wait for herd immunity to set in. There's been significant mortality and severe infections, even though we're far, as it seems, from herd immunity. And in terms of long-term strategies, there are many imperfect strategies which, in my view, should be used to add up to control. Rather than thinking about a single silver bullet like strategies, things like masks, testing and contact tracing, and also leveraging serological tests for shield immunity in particular contexts in which we think they can be uh, piloted. I think all these together are the way to move forward, um, and we'll see if we have the will or desire to do so. So with that, I think I'll stop. Uh, again, just to thank collaborators, thank you for listening at the end of a long day, and happy to take a few questions. Perfect. Can I start with a question, Celia? Um, it's not maybe directly related to what you are saying, but I mean, I've been tracking the same data that we are looking at in Georgia and that you're looking at in Georgia, and the number of infections seems to be going up even in higher proportions than the number of tests that we are performing. It has been going up uh, for a couple of weeks now, and the number of fatalities keeps on going down. So any thoughts about why is this happening? So I'll just put a context, which is the issue you're raising has a couple answers, and I don't think we have a definitive answer yet. First of all, as you know, uh, hospitalizations and fatalities are lagged indicators. So there's one part of the answer. Another weeks. issue, no, it's, uh, can I, let me just, let me finish. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just a two-week issue because depending on treatment and depending on whether people want to go to the hospital, but it can even be beyond two weeks. It can be even three weeks uh, in terms of the average time between infection and showing up with fatalities because of reporting lags, right? So it's not just it's the ideology of the disease, also reporting lags, which in Georgia are notoriously two weeks. Other places, they may be shorter. The other issue, as you probably know too, and as others have heard, there's may be some indications of age shifts, right? And with age shifts, if more younger people are being infected, there's a very big curve and shape in terms of the infection fatality risk, both for severe diseases, the incidence of asymptomatic cases, which is also age dependent, and fatalities. So I have some concerns, uh, and we don't know enough yet, that there may be increased um, spread within younger individuals, which we may then see going back uh, into older individuals 
later on. It's still early, as you saw, you know, there's been some fluctuations. There were other like, pseudo peaks in late April, uh, but you're right. This is not the only uh, state in which that's happening. We are also concerned. Uh, I think right now, um, my instinct is this has to do to some extent with some age shifts in infection, but we have yet to see enough data to know for sure. Yep. Thanks. Anyone else? I have a question of Jose Mushi. Yep. Right. I have a question about, I like your idea that uh, of using uh, different uh, methods of trying to, to avoid it. So don't try to look for a silver bullet, but try to put many, many of these strategies together uh, and, and to do it. Have you do the study of how uncorrelated these things are? Can you consider that these are different random variables or there's a strong correlation among them? Yeah, I think I understand your point, right? Because if we do four or five different things, but they're really just variations on the same thing, we're, we're not getting, let's say, or, orthogonal benefits. A similar idea came up a while back on climate wedges for trying to stop CO2 gains, trying to think of different approaches. I mean, I like to think of it through that lens of the different um, stages of trying to control. Meaning if you're working at the probability that a potentially infectious contact is gonna to lead to an infection, you're in the mass category, which is different than trying to even reduce the probability that someone who you might uh, interact with is susceptible if you're infected. But for example, just so just, I, just sorry yeah. about interrupting you, but like yeah, for example, sorry. how much social distance and masking related to them? Have we, we have any study to that or they are really unrelated variables? If everyone had uh, strong social distancing, I don't have to have a mass. I mean, there's always some bottom level. What's interesting is that there's some, uh, there's evidence from the mobility reports, Google mobility reports, that obviously that's been creeping up in many states for a while. Unfortunately, even before it looked like we passed the local peak. And so in that case, those mobility reports do not tell you how compliant people are, are with masks. I think there is some trade-off there. If I stay home or if I'm outside interacting with people wearing a mask, we don't have an exact, I mean, these things are harder than rocket science. We do not have the data there to tell you definitively what the trade-off is, right? With respect to other places, I know that we're far from the kind of compliance that places like Hong Kong have seen. So a recent study went and just looked at people before they boarded the subway and found around 97% compliance of facial mask coverings. Now, at that sort of level, can we quantify exactly how much uh, reduction? Frankly, it's hard. So Andrew Gelman, in a blog post responding to Molina's PNAS paper on mass, basically said, this is nearly impossible because of entanglement. Many things are happening at once. Whereas Molina's paper said, masks are the primary cause behind all these reductions. I don't think we can say that definitively. We know they're helpful but it's very hard to disentangle when many kinds of interventions are happening at the same time. We're gonna be trying to pilot something in a small scale setting. We can't wait for that necessarily to scale out to the population. I know that's not a satisfactory answer, but that's one of the hard things, that many good things are hard to prove independently because we don't have time to do them each independently. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, then thanks to both our speakers today. These were really super talks. Um, I don't know, let's see. We'll have our next one, our next faculty seminar at the end of July. And uh, I'll keep you all posted in the meantime with other updates. Um, I think that's it. So thanks for thanks for joining us today. Thank you, speakers, and thank you, Margie. Thank you. Thank you very much.